So for those who've been following us for a while, you guys know that we've been doing our videos very professionally. We have a video camera, video set, the whole nine yards. Uh, but in this video, I'm gonna give you a raw look on our rental property that I bought for $2,500 down. Now, to begin, how we found it was we found it through a software called PropStream. And you may have heard me mention this software before. Um, in fact, you can get a seven day free trial down below. But we, the way we did it was with PropStream, we're able to look at properties that are owned by landlords. And specifically, what I was looking for was uh, landlords that were LLC. So LLCs, for those who don't know what that is, it's Limited Liability Company. And I wanted to look for uh, landlords that bought their rental property using an LLC because number one, a lot of times, uh, property owners that have an LLC tend to also have other rental properties as well. So they have five or 10 or sometimes even 20 rental properties uh, if, they have a, if they have an LLC. Now, another thing with an LLC is that a lot of times, about 40% of the time, LLC owners typically have an attorney, a go-to attorney that represents the LLC as a registered agent. And what I can do, here in Illinois at least, I can look up the LLC and I can also find out who the registered agent is. And usually 40 to 50% of the time, a lot of the LLCs have a registered agent who also happens to be an attorney. Now, once I crack down on who the attorney is, I can usually Google the attorney's name and get their phone number, address, email, the whole nine yard. So with this particular property I'm gonna show you guys, I emailed the attorney that was the registered agent for the LLC and what I wrote to the attorney was, hey, you know, I see that you represent such and such LLC. Uh, would you mind asking your client if they will be interested in selling this said property? And then what happened after was that the owners of the property actually reached out to me um, asking to come see the property, which is very interesting. Now, mind you that this was off market. This was not listed in the MLS. This is not listed uh, it, with the realtor. So essentially it was me and the owner and that was pretty much it. No realtor, no one involved in the between, um, other than the attorney of course. So right now we're gonna go see the property and I'm gonna show you the exterior. We do have a tenant inside. I don't wanna disrespect the tenant at all, uh, but I will show you the exterior and kind of give you the walk around uh, to look at how the property looks like. All right guys, so behind me is the house that I bought for $2,500 down. In fact, I did the closing, signed the paperwork in that driveway that you're seeing behind me there. So. Um, that's the house. I don't want to disturb the tenants too much. Uh, I know the, there's a car in the driveway right now, so uh, I'm just gonna give you some, you know, shots, B-rolls, uh, give you different angles of the house, just to see that, just to see that the house is there. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go and break down the numbers on that rental property behind me. All right, everybody, I got my whiteboard here, so I'm gonna go and break down the numbers on this rental property and show you my analysis process when I bought this property. So we always start with the gross rent, which is $1,200 a month for this area. Now, uh, the, there was a tenant already paying that amount every single month when I first bought it. So I, I inherited a tenant paying me $1,200 a month. Now, from there, what I like to do is I subtract what's called a vacancy allowance. Now, a vacancy allowance anywhere between five to eight uh, percent. This particular area, there weren't a whole lot of vacancy going on, so I put in about five percent out of the gross month as what I like to call uh, the vacancy allowance. So I'm going to subtract sixty dollars, and this is vacancy allowance. And the reason why we do this is that in case you have an entire month or half a month where you don't have a tenant in there, right? The tenant moves out, they wanna go somewhere else, and you have to deal with the fact that um, you're gonna have an empty property, not paying, not collecting rent. So I'm gonna build in that loss into my monthly figure so that when I do have a vacant property, I'm not surprised by the fact that, oh my gosh, I'm not collecting rent, I've already built that expense in there. So this is gross rent, okay, I wanna label everything. 
and this is vacancy allowance. I'm also going to subtract the uh, the property taxes, right? Every month we're going to pay property taxes, and uh, for this specific property at that time, uh, the property taxes was $231 every month. So this is property taxes. Now, some of you guys might be thinking this is awfully high. Well, welcome to Illinois. Um, this is what I was paying, and this has changed ever since. Uh, it went up slightly higher, but not significantly. I think it went up like by four or five dollars every month, so not a you know huge deal, but still went up. Um, the next thing I subtract out of that is the insurance cost on this property. Now this is a single family; it's not going to cost me an arm and a leg for the insurance, but it's going to cost me about thirty three dollars and twenty three cents a month for the homeowner's insurance. So this is insurance. Now when you do an analysis. Um, with the insurance. This is a hard part, hard part because you won't know what the cost of the insurance is going to be unless you actually get a quote from a, an insurance agent uh, and, and they you know, assess the, the building, the risk, and the whole nine yards. So unfortunately, when you do a, an analysis on a property before you buy it, you're not going to have a 100% number as far as the insurance. So typically with a single family, depending on the size, where it is, it's going to range anywhere between 30 to, I've seen as high as $80 a month on in insurance. This is why you may want to have an insurance agent in your team just so that, hey, quickly, you, you, know, you can get an idea of what the cost is going to be. Okay, the next thing I put in there was the property management cost of $96. So uh, my property manager charges about 8% in terms of the property management fee. Now, this may change for some of you guys. This could be 10%, 12% um, property management fee. And you guys know that I'm coming out with an automated property management software pretty soon. So I may not have to pay that 8% anymore. But um, at the time, I was paying a property manager. So 8% is going to be $96 on this uh, $1,200 gross. So everything that I do here is based on the gross rent, right? 8% uh, of the gross rent. Vacancy allowance, 5% of the gross rent. Uh, the next thing I'm going to uh, build in there is the maintenance reserve. So uh, maintenance is essentially, I, I put in, I think this was, I put in 9%, I think, uh, at the time. So 9% maintenance, typically I want 10%, but um, I guess I took a, a lower number for this. But let's just say 9% because that's what I have on my fact sheet. At the time that I analyzed this property, I, I have the data right here, um, that's how I analyze it. Now, this $110, I may not uh, expense this every month. Uh, I may see a month way where I pay 200 bucks for maintenance. I may see a month where uh, I need to fix the plumbing issue, and it's like 400 bucks. But um, if there's going to be months where I don't have to fix anything, right? So I'm just going to let this $110 sit and keep it separate uh, in case I do run into a bigger item such as, um, you know, roof replacement. Um, I need to uh, replace the carpet, right? All those things I have to factor in the cost every month so that, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not ex unexpectedly like, oh my gosh, there's a $2,000 bill I got to pay. I built it in already. So uh, with all that cost being said, the total calculation, so we're taking $1,200 minus 60, 231, 33 and 23 cents, 96, 110. The NOI on this is $669.70. Now NOI stands for net operating income. So that's gross income, uh, gross rent minus all the operating expenses. So, so to keep my rental property going and, and profitable, these are the expenses I gotta I gotta put out there, right? So the net operating expenses, uh, net operating income is six hundred sixty nine dollars and seventy cents. Now the next thing we have to talk about is uh, the financing on it. Now the financing, um, I'll, I'll give you a little breakdown here. So what I've done initially, I've, I, I've analyzed the number, and I need to know what the NOI is so that I know when I offer uh, financing because you guys know that this is owner financing. I know what payment amount I gotta have in order for this deal to work. So what I've done is, uh, okay, i got to make the monthly payment to fit inside the $669.70, preferably way lower than that because that means it's cash flow. Um, initial offer, what I did, I'll, I'll go and subtract, uh, erase this here, and we'll keep in mind that our NOI is $669.70. So my initial offer to, uh, and I'll put this on the screen right now, my initial offer to the seller was uh, owner financing, $90,000 purchase price, and I offered 15-year amortization, 
And initially, I didn't have any balloon um, on it, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you what the final term was. So this is what I initially offered and say, hey, this is what I'm willing to offer you for the term of the purchase. 15-year amortization, 4.25% uh, interest, because that was the going rate at the time for uh, for residential mortgage rate. And then uh, ultimately, what this would end up being, uh, oh, oh, actually, we've got to put the, the, the down payment, so $2,000 down. That was my initial offer, and I put this on a, what's called a letter of intent. Um, and I'll, again, I'll throw that on the screen here, but this is what I threw in, and then um, the seller said, you know, I gotta talk to my attorney, and I gotta talk to my accountant. I'm like, okay, great, yeah, talk, talk to your accountant and see what uh, he or she has to say. Comes back and says, well, I don't know if this, you know, if we're gonna make this work. Down payment's a little too low. I don't wanna wait 15 years until, you know, this is all paid off. Um, which, by the way, the $90,000 was the, the original asking price. I didn't try to negotiate the price, uh, I could have maybe, but when it comes to owner financing, my general rule, and if, if I can get away with it, I would try to you know finagle with the price here. But uh, my general rule for owner financing is keep the uh, let them have the asking price, let the sellers have the asking price as long as it's within a reasonable range, right? If the comps, if the, if the going value of the home for this type of home around that area is you know like say hundred thousand dollars, then and, and the asking price is like one hundred fifty thousand, well. Obviously, that's not reasonable, right? That I'd be like, okay, no, thank you. You know, that's a little too high. But you know, if the seller asks, well, I want hundred five thousand dollars for it, I'm like, eh, that's that's pretty close. I'm not gonna argue that. So ninety thousand dollars actually was pretty good price for the area. In fact, I'll I'll throw in a little kicker in just a minute. But ninety thousand was 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 what they're asking. Uh, the term, this is what I offered, okay? They came back and, ah, the down payment's too low. Well, okay, what if we offered you a $5,000 down and they had, you know, they were still struggling with the 15-year part. So I'm like, oh, all right, how about this? I'll give you what's called a five-year balloon. What a five-year balloon is, um, within five years of the financing, I have to make a full payment. Whatever the remaining balance on the owner financing is, I gotta, I gotta make a cut a check for the seller to pay off whatever remaining balance is. So typically, I would do that um, by, you know, t getting a bank financing on this, right? Going out, get a bank financing. But I would be in a much better position because five years down the road, my LTV, my loan to value, what I owe versus the value of the home will be far significantly less than, um, you know, if I were to make a fresh purchase of eighty, you know, twenty percent down and so on. So uh, we came to this term. Uh, I, I like the fact that I got to keep the interest rate, which was pretty cool. 4.25%, $5,000 down, 15-year amortization, five-year balloon. So uh, I bought this three years ago, so I got two more years to go. In two years, I have to come up with financing or whatever the remaining amount uh, of this is. Um, now, with the $5,000 down, this is the cool part. I was able to negotiate uh, a way to get what I wanted. Uh, I still wanted that $2,000 down, right? So what I did is I said, you know what, Mr. Mrs. Seller, what if I? Uh, what if we did this? Instead of having to give me the security deposit, because the tenant gave you the security deposit, right? And uh, landlords don't keep that security deposit. It's not their money. It technically still belongs to the tenant. So I said, you know, instead of writing, cutting me a check, uh, you know, I give you five thousand dollars, and then you give me a check for security deposit. What if we just lump those two together and said, you know what? Let's do five thousand dollars minus whatever security deposit is, and let's go and also throw in one month's rent in there. And the seller is like, well, that actually doesn't sound too bad. So uh, when we added the security deposit and one month's rent, it actually ended up being $2,500. So te the technical term for this is called closing credit. I got a closing credit for $2,500, which ultimately my net uh, pay or pay che uh, uh, check that I had to write was... $2,500. So um, basically, I kind of got away with what I wanted with the $2,000 down. Um, of course, at the at the end of the tenant moving out, I, you know, of course, I have to fork over the, the $2,500. But what's nice is that it's cash that I didn't come out, come out right now, right? So ultimately, $2,500 down. Um, but my, my mortgage payment, my uh, owner financing payment that I would pay to the seller is $600. And fifty? No, I'm sorry. The final final payment actually came out to be. Uh, let's see. I'm I'm looking at the data sheet here. I, I just want to make sure I got this right. Oh, six hundred thirty nine dollars. My bad, guys. So six hundred thirty nine dollars. So I I'm essentially cash flowing thirty dollars and seventy cents. But here's the thing: it's on a fifteen year amortization, meaning I'm paying this off faster than ever before. 
Here's another kicker. I got this a real estate agent pull a comps on this property about a year ago, and I and I was just curious. I'm like, you know, if I if I were to sell this thing right now, what would the value be? So my real estate agent comes back and says, you know, what? I'll get a CMA on this and see what what it is. So on November 2018, the comps on this specific property came out to be 114 thousand. $520. Well, guess what, guys? I paid $90,000 for this property. The value is $114,528. So in a span of a, about a year and a half, I became about $24,000 richer, uh, wealthier, by just keeping the property. And plus, I'm on the, I have a 15-year amortization on this, so I'm paying down the seller financing as, as fast as possible. Now, if I were to go and get a bank financing on a fixed 30 years, obviously, I'm going to have a bigger number because my monthly payment on my principal and interest will go down. So realistically, if I refinance this, quote unquote, into a 30-year fix, I'm going to be walking away with anywhere between $130 to $150 a month in cash flow. Um, and not to mention, I got like $25,000 wealthier from this property. So just to give you a little um, breakdown of, uh, of how the negotiation process went, as well as what my offer was, uh, how I calculate the numbers. And right now, I still have this property. And I, I love the tenants. Their tenants are amazing. Um, I'm still collecting $30.70. It's a nice little gas money. Um, but my, my, my investments are always on a long term basis. Uh, I, I never try to get short-term income and sacrifice long-term. I try to protect my long-term uh, investment because at the end of the day, that's how you become wealthier. Okay. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that video of me breaking down the rental property that I bought for $2,500 down. I hope you found it valuable. And if you did, be sure to subscribe and like the video. It does help us out a lot with our YouTube algorithm. I'm actually on the way to my next rental property right now, my four-unit apartment building. Uh, we actually did zero money down on my own so if you guys want to see that breakdown be sure to comment down below and I'll have a video for that as well so be sure to subscribe and tune in for the next video